We are live to tape, so a good morning once again to you all. It's nice to see you here. I am mindful that today is a, a legal holiday uh, in the U.S., so uh, officially we have no class, but as you're well aware, in order not to interrupt our special lecture sequence in this course with the Monday plenaries and the breakouts uh, at various times during the week with different instructors, uh, it's important that we remain um, in, in sequence with our Monday plenaries. So, um, holiday or not, I will, I will be here uh, to uh, deliver the Monday lecture. And again, those of you who are uh, willing and able to make it are obviously welcome. We'll, we'll have an interesting topic this morning, I assure you. And again, to those who will take advantage of the holiday, which you're certainly entitled to do, uh, you will still be responsible for watching this later at your convenience asynchronously, okay? So uh, today uh, we're going to look at Plato and specifically uh, Plato's ethics. Uh, there's a very good reason why you all know Plato's name. Uh, even before you started this course, you, you, I'm sure you knew Plato's name and probably Aristotle's name as well, although you may not have... Uh, encountered their writings until now, uh, there's still a reason why we talk about them and why we study them in almost every introductory course and beyond. Um, there, there's a, a famous quotation, some of you may or may not know this, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, a great American philosopher of the 20th century, uh, once, uh, once wrote that Western philosophy, the history of Western philosophy, he said, is 2,000 years of footnotes to Plato. Uh, so, uh, in other words, Plato raised just about every question that Western philosophers have, have dealt with in the subsequent two, you know, two millennia. So that's obviously a nod to his importance and to the importance of his mentor, Socrates, because remember, Plato was a student himself uh, and witnessed a fairly catastrophic set of events. He was caught up in uh, something that history recalls as the Peloponnesian War. Uh, do, do, have any of you encountered the Peloponnesian War, perhaps in your world civilization courses uh, or in a history course? Please tell me if you have. I'm just curious to know. Is there a yes from anyone in the room? Uh, you heard of it in history. Well, that's good, Ramsey. So I'm, I'm glad in a way that they're... Uh, that they're still teaching, and certainly it's, it's an important part of ancient history, and it bears on philosophy as well, because it was a war between Sparta and Athens, some of you may know, and they were the two great city-states uh, of the day in the Mediterranean. Uh, they were basically, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a kind of an empire. We speak about Hellenic civilization, and the flower of that great civilization uh, was epicentered in Athens and Sparta, there were many city-states and, and other kingdoms in the region. But Athens was famous not only for its philosophers, but for its navy. It was a great naval power and a trading nation. And Sparta was famous for its army. Some of you may have seen the movie 300 Spartans, either the earlier version or the more recent version, in which uh, a very small vanguard of Spartans under King Leonides uh, held off the Persian Empire at the... Uh, at the pass of Thermopylae and thereby uh, saved, in a certain sense, Western civilization from domination. Uh, so, so Sparta was, was, was very famous, and we still have the adjective Spartan in the English language when we refer to something as Spartan. Does anybody know what that means? Any of you heard of the adjective Spartan? Put that in the chat room. It means minimalist. The Spartans were a military culture and therefore devoted most of their expenditures to training. Uh, they were very famous for wearing red cloaks so that no enemy would ever see their blood on the battlefield. And they were a warrior, uh, you know, very, very uh, celebrated and skillful warrior class. And Spartan uh, today is an adjective that means nothing extravagant or ostentatious. Um, basically whatever uh, conduces to simplicity and, in their case, to the success of their armies. Okay, uh, ba back to the philosophy. Uh, we're going to focus on, on Plato and the differences between his conception of, of goodness and justice and, 
Aristotle's, yeah? So anyway, Plato lived through the Peloponnesian War, and he saw in its aftermath some horrific things. Uh, the uh, martyrdom of his mentor, Socrates, who, uh, when Sparta basically conquered uh, Athens while they won the war, although really it was a 30-year uh, war, and uh, in, in those days, a 30-year war was more like a 60-year war because life expectancies were shorter. And imagine a war of 60 years that, that commits the full resources of a city-state. It was exhausting to both of them. And although Sparta won that war, in a sense, that neither Sparta nor Athens are, ever recovered uh, its, its strength and vitality in the aftermath of that conflict. And uh, they were in a state of decline. But Athens set up a puppet government, uh, I mean, rather, Sparta set up a puppet government in Athens, and they arrested Socrates on trumped-up charges because they were afraid of Socrates. He was a, he was a, a philosopher of, of, of note, and so they sought to silence him. They arrested him. They put him on trial. He was tried according to Greek, to Greek law. Um, but uh, he defended himself, and uh, that is recorded in Plato's dialogue, um, and his death is recorded in the, in the Apology, and, uh, you know, the attempt to the, bribe the guards and rescue him from the death sentence is described by Plato in the dialogue Crito. Uh, so quite a bit of, of Plato's work is devoted not only to the philosophy of his mentor, but also to the demise and the death of his mentor. Socrates remained in Athens and accepted the death penalty, and they were unable to persuade him to flee, even though they had bribed the guards and arranged for his escape to Thebes. Uh, Socrates said, well, if you can convince me by a rational argument to leave, I'll leave. But if you can't convince me to, by rational argument to leave, I won't leave. Uh, and Crito, his, his best friend or one of his best friends and student, has a dialogue where he attempts to convince Socrates that it's certainly not in his interest to accept an unjust death sentence. And Socrates, being very Socratic, says, well, uh, I mean, he's able to refute every argument that Crito brings. And at the end of the day, Socrates prefers to die with honor rather than live with dishonor. He claims that the laws were just and that all his life he lived in Athens and was happy to accept those laws as being just. And now that the laws have been corrupted to, you know, and turned against him, he says he'd be a hypocrite for now refusing to obey the laws just because he is not favored by them in this particular case, even though his life hangs in the balance. It's a very, very famous argument that he brings to bear. And if you're interested in it, the, it's a short dialogue. It's called the Crito. And uh, Crito's are not, are not able to persuade him to remain. Socrates says the laws are just, but the people, the men who are in charge at the moment are unjust. And he would only be adding injustice to, to injustice were he to flee. And indeed, had he fled, it's entirely possible that, uh, <laughs> that we wouldn't be studying him today with the same ardor that we do, because he's someone who lived truly according to his word and his honor. So that's a debatable point, but Socrates remained and died. And Plato's Republic, which is his longest and one of his most famous dialogues, in which he really articulates some of the theories we're going to look at this morning, and Plato's Republic is an attempt to describe what a utopia might look like. It's a very early attempt to describe uh, how to set up and maintain a state which would not be subject to the foibles that Athens was subject to and would therefore not be conquered, would not decline, would not fall, um, and, and would not uh, put to death some of its brightest citizens. Uh, so the Republic is very important because it can be construed as Plato's version of utopia, but it's underpinned by Plato's very particular philosophy of how this is to be achieved. So this is one of the things that, that Plato was famous for. Uh, and we'll be looking at a particular extract or two this morning. Uh, Socrates uh, was obviously a very influential figure, and we have to take Plato as his mouthpiece because we don't have any other independent accounts of Socrates' writings, really, other than the ones Plato gives us. Scholars think, for the most part, that the earlier writings of Plato, the earlier dialogues of Plato, are more authentic reports of what Socrates taught, and that later in the Republic, we were getting Plato's own words uh, in the mouth of Socrates. So Plato tends to enlist Socrates as a mouthpiece 
for him to deliver his own version to us of, of what he deems to be uh, ethical and just. That's in the, in the Republic, sometimes called the Politoi. All right, so we'll be there in a few minutes. You might also want to know that Aristotle, of course, who, who, knew, who knew full well uh, uh, what, what the, the tradition was, I mean, he'd studied with Plato for some 16 or 17 years in the academy, but as you saw last week, disagreed with him. Uh, on certain key points, and for that reason was not named his successor and was obliged to found his own school called the Lyceum. Uh, but after the fall of, uh, of Alexander, the great whom Aristotle had tutored as a young man, uh, things uh, turned against Macedonia. Alexander was from Macedonia, a neighboring province, still is a neighboring part of, well, it's maybe independent today, but it was part of Hellenic civilization. And, 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 and Aristotle, uh, you know, had taught Alexander. But after Alexander's downfall and death at a young age, uh, public opinion in Athens turned against uh, Macedonia and, uh, and Alexander. And Aristotle himself came into danger because it was well known that he had been a tutor of, of uh, Alexander the Great. So Aristotle also um, feared for his life, and in his case, he fled. Uh, he, he, he fled. He said very famously he would not give Athenians an opportunity to sin twice against philosophy. So uh, unlike Socrates, who stayed and, and accepted the death penalty, Aristotle uh, got out of Dodge before he, they trumped up charges against him. Uh, but uh, as, as it happened, he joined very soon after in exile. So I guess the moral of that story is uh, maybe that you can run, but you can't hide. Uh, but uh, we still have a lot of fascination with this uh, account of the sort of patriarchs of Hellenic philosophy. And it's not because of what they went through uh, so much as what, what they wrote and thought about it that pertains to us today. So let's fast forward for a moment. And let me recall to you, what we saw um, last day briefly, the uh, very famous painting uh, by Raphael, which I know some of you have seen. I'll just share the screen with you so we can revisit it. Um, it's called The School of Athens. It's hanging in uh, the, the, uh, uh, the pu a public gallery in the Vatican. And if you're ever in Rome, uh, I certainly uh, would advise you to see it. There's quite a lineup to see it. You'll, you'll, you'll encounter quite a, quite a queue uh, because it's a very popular painting, but it's one of the most famous paintings of the Italian Renaissance, uh, completed around 1510 by Raphael. And Pope Julius, who commissioned it, um, was so happy with it that he even allowed Raphael to remain in the painting. Raphael had painted himself into it somewhere down here in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, p painters often did this. They wanted to stick their faces into their own paintings. And Raphael, put, I think he's this guy, uh, but or this guy. And uh, But the commissioner, uh, the Pope, said, no, that's fine, you could, you could stay. He didn't make him paint his face out. But the central portions of the painting... Uh, the central panel of the painting features Plato and Aristotle, and we'll have a closer look today, of course, at why Plato's in the center and why his finger's pointing in the air. Um, so each one of these characters has pretty much been identified by art historians, and if you're really interested in the painting, you can look online. There are sort of uh, uh, decodings of it which go by number, and they have, a, they have numbers that are about 40, 30 or 40 different numbers that associate, uh, you know, each number associated with a different philosopher, and many of them, if not most of them, have been identified, so you can always look that up if you want to know who's who in the painting itself. But again, we're going to focus on, obviously, the central two, Aristotle and Plato. Let me pull up a, uh, let me just pull up for you a close-up of that. So um, you can see them again. Let me share with you the close-up of that screen, um, if I'm able. Here they are in a closer-up version. 
So, uh, as it happens, Plato has the face of Leonardo da Vinci. We don't know what Plato and Aristotle really looked like outside of the busts, the sculptures we have from them, but uh, uh, Raphael chose to put Leonardo's face on Plato. It kind of fits, looks good on him, and Aristotle is just someone he, he, he made up. But you know the significance of their gestures. Uh, Aristotle's holding his ethics, which we looked at last week, and he's pointing straight out, his arm is pointing straight out, as if to say, we are embodied beings, and we will become good and just by proportioning our conduct accordingly. And, and as you know, his virtue ethics are based on the golden mean, that every virtue lies between two vices, the vice of deficiency and the vice of excess, and that our conduct, like our art, if it's deemed to be good, will be well proportioned. So virtue is proportionality, moderation in most things, with tolerable exceptions, because remember, murder and adultery and theft are, are never, for Aristotle, going to be right, even if they're done in moderation. That doesn't justify them. But most other things are done, whether they're intellectual pursuits or athletic pursuits, or in this case, ethical pursuits are going to be practiced in moderation. Uh, Plato is not opposed to Aristotle, but he's pointing straight up at the sky, and he's not giving Aristotle the finger. Uh, he's pointing upward for a very important reason, and he's holding a book uh, called the Timaeo, and that's pretty much his cosmology and his theory of the soul. It's expressed in other dialogues, too, and his theory of forms, which is also uh, discussed in the extract from the Republic that we'll look at. Plato is pointing upward because he wants to tell Aristotle that the ideas of goodness and justice are not proportional uh, aspects of our conduct on earth, they're actually copies of pure forms. And it's Plato's theory of the forms that turns out to be a unique and enduring contribution to philosophy. One of the reasons why we still study him. Some of you uh, will probably really enjoy this. Others may be mystified by it. Plato was somewhat of a mystic and very poetic as well, a dramatist too. Uh, some of you may actually be appalled by it in terms of how it applies to art, because it does, remember, apply both uh, to uh, the branches of axiology that we call ethics and aesthetics. Uh, but we'll, we'll focus on the ethics this morning. But the forms and his theory of the forms also apply just as well to aesthetics. And we'll mention in passing how that works out. So they're not opposed, but they're at 90 degrees, right? They're orthogonal. And Plato is pointing up at the sky because the forms, according to Plato, are outside of space and time. The ideals that, that Plato is espousing are not things that are material. They're immaterial. And uh, Plato has, for reasons which will become very clear shortly, tremendous traction in Christian cultures. You know, Aristotle, as we have seen, has huge influence in Christianity and in Islam because of his work in mathematics and science. And uh, Christian cultures have always, uh, since the early modern period at least, been at the leading edge of scientific development, and that's partly because of Aristotle's influence and, of course, other modern things. Uh, but also Islamic culture, as I mentioned during the golden age of the caliphs, for example, across North Africa, had studied Aristotle. They had translated him into Arabic, and they had studied him. And they were very impressed with his ethics and also with his work in geometry and politics and economics and science, biology and physics and so forth. And so a lot of the uh, fruits of that particular period, roughly 1000 to 1300 AD, that came out of uh, this Islamic Golden Age, or the Age of the Caliphs, is actually uh, built partly upon Aristotle's influence, because the advances then were furthered uh, in medicine, in mathematics, and other sciences. And this was partly owing to Aristotle's influence. So he uh, was taken up both by Christian cultures and by Islamic cultures and influenced many Islamic philosophers of importance, and some of you may know this. But Plato predominantly was taken up by Christian culture. 
and not so much by uh, Jewish culture and not so much by Islamic culture. And there's a really interesting reason for this, which we'll come to when we explain his ontology of the forms, and that I'm going to do today. Okay, so that's just a bit of a setup. Uh, Plato definitely is the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, father of Western philosophy as, as we know it uh, from its earliest days, although he was in company with many, many pre-Socratics uh, who influenced him and Socratic philosophers and post-Socratic philosophers. But Plato's name stands head and shoulders above them, along with Aristotle. And that's why Raphael put them front and center in this painting. And we notice that, uh, that uh, all the time uh, in, in history of, of Christianity, we will see these revivals, the Italian Renaissance being a very good example of it, a revival of philosophy, a revival of science, a revival of art. And they always, almost always have in Western uh, history, Plato's name attached to them. We often call them Neoplatonic revivals. In other words, we're resuscitating important elements of Plato's philosophy, and, uh, and that speaks to uh, its endurance over time. Okay, So what, what is it then that, that Plato is trying to, to tell us? Um, I think that the easiest way or the most direct way uh, to penetrate this will be uh, to discuss his allegory of the cave, have any of you ever heard of Plato's cave? I'll type that phrase in, Plato's cave. Has anyone heard of that expression? Does that ring a bell with any of you? Plato's cave, or as it's properly called, the allegory of the cave. It's an allegory. You think so, Ramses? Okay, well, allegory of the cave, because it is an allegory, stronger than a metaphor. Uh, it's an allegory, and it comes from Book 7. Book 7 of the Republic is where we encounter this allegory. I'm going to share a description of it with you pictorially so we can discuss it. Book 7 of Plato's Republic. I'm just typing that in in case you want to find it. It's in your textbook as well. You have an extract from Book 7 which describes the cave. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, my own description of it, so you, you have another reference point. The book does a good job of describing it. I'm going to show you a, a, an artist's conception of the cave, and then we'll discuss what it represents. So bear with me, and I will reshare the screen. All right, so uh, hopefully... You can see this. Uh, you see that it's a scene set underground. I think this allegory uh, has important traction today, much more so in the last few years than, than perhaps in the preceding 10 or 15, but every generation seems to find some meaning in it. What you see is a cave, and if you look at the left-hand side of the picture, you'll see some prisoners chained up to a wall. You just see a couple of them there. Uh, but they are actually represented as being chained to a wall. They can't get up and move, and they can't turn around to look at what's behind them either. So they're basically obliged to face front and see what is being shown to them on the cave wall. All right? Now, what is being shown to them are shadows, as you can see, behind them, there's a fire burning, right? And there are people whom they can't see. And these people are holding up various objects. And since the objects are being held up between the fire and the wall, the firelight projects them onto the wall as shadows. Is that clear? Is everybody clear about this? So what, in fact, they are seeing is not what is real in the sense of seeing these real three-dimensional objects, but what they are really seeing are fuzzy gray shadows that are dancing on the cave wall. 
And no, they've never seen anything else, Ramses. They, you imagine that in this allegory, they've been born chained up to the cave wall and they will stay there for their whole lives. And the only thing they're ever going to know uh, are these shadows. And they will also hear echoes because these people behind them, whom they can't see, well, may be saying different things as well. And those uh, sounds will become audible to them. But as well, uh, those sounds will just be indistinct because there'll be echoes. You know, they'll be echoing. They won't be clear. Just as the images aren't clear. Look, the images are, are, are of three-dimensional objects that have color. Yes? Uh, but here they're just seen as gray, you know, kind of gray shadows, indistinct shadows. And uh, the sounds similarly that are made will only be heard as indistinct echoes. So this is all they're ever going to know. And this is what they will deem to be reality because uh, Plato is saying, of course, that whatever it is we grow up with is what we take to be reality. Whatever is put in front of us to see and whatever stories we're told, you know, in terms of what we hear, is the only basis we have for forming an impression of reality. If we are constrained in such a way as to see only the shadows of things that are selected to be shown to us and of hearing only the echoes of words that are selected to be told to us, then we will never know anything more. And in fact, we will assume that the totality of our experience of life is in fact contained by these shadows and echoes. So obviously we're leading, as you all realize, kind of an impoverished life if we were chained up in that situation. Plato's message is, however, that most people are chained up in that situation, only they don't realize it. This is an allegory. We may not be physically constrained, but we are culturally constrained. <laughs> And so you can think in a modern context, if you like, of those figures who are holding up those, uh, you know, those, those statues in front of the fire. Uh, those are the elites that rule us. These are the political elites or the economic elites or the Silicon Valley elites. And they're showing us the images they want us to see and nothing else. So the contemporary equivalent, I think, is very poignant. Uh, the people who operate uh, the search engines on, on, on platforms like Google and YouTube are wanting us to find exactly what they want us to find and nothing else. Is it not the case? And if they don't want you to find something, they simply censor it. So you're only seeing and finding what it is they want you to find. This may sound like a conspiracy theory, uh, and it is one, but it unfortunately matches up pretty well with certain aspects of our own reality today, that we're being told what, we, what, what the elites want us to hear, and we're, and we're shown the images that they want us to see. And the only difference is, I would submit to you, that today Plato's cave has a little more technology, so each of these prisoners you could think of has a remote, you know, so they can change the channel. Okay, so they have a remote in the cave, and they could they could change which set of shadows and echoes they want to see and hear, perhaps by changing the channel, but every channel is going to be controlled by the people who are invisible to them. Is that fair enough? Does that make sense to you? And in a totalitarian state, the controls would be very, very tight. So there'd be no escape from the propaganda or no escape from the fake news or no escape from the images that it serves the interests of the state to impose on us. Is this clear? Is this all, at all clear to you? Yeah? Okay. I, I, I'm glad you find it interesting, uh, Ilma. Plato is interesting for, to every generation for this reason. He, he's giving us a, a picture of something that speaks to us all, I think, across space and time and, and is easily transposed to our own situations. Uh, and so if we are these prisoners uh, and we would like to have a, a, you know, a deeper grasp of reality, uh, and again, uh, some of you have written about Descartes and your essays on the whole are, are quite good. Uh, the ones who, who've written about Descartes are understanding uh, that it's sometimes impossible to tell the difference between perception and reality. And now you also see from this picture that Plato is actually the one who first, in, in a certain way, propounded this problem. Descartes did not invent the problem himself of the difficulty in distinguishing appearance from reality. Uh, he definitely resuscitated the problem in his own way, 
in the 17th century, but he also got it from Plato, because here we see a much, much earlier depiction of, once again, that distinction between appearance and reality. It's perfectly obvious to us that what appears to these prisoners in terms of shadows and echoes is nothing like reality. So Plato asks the following question, what if someone could set themselves free? What if one of these prisoners could slip the chains? And, and actually turn around and look behind him. Well, the first thing that would happen is that, that they'd be blinded by the firelight because their eyes would have to grow accustomed. If they're sitting in the front part of the cave, which is largely in shadow, uh, then, then they would turn around and be blinded initially. But then once their eyes adjusted, they would realize that what they are seeing on the cave wall um, are only, no, not sunlight, no, 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 no. Uh, they're still in the cave. I'm not saying they're out of the cave yet. They've just escaped from the shackles. They're turning around and looking at the fire. Okay? I don't mean the sunlight. I mean the fire. The first stage is to get up and see what's behind you. And what's behind you is a fire burning that is that is casting those shadows on the wall. Okay? We clear, Ramses and others? The first thing they see is the fire, but it's still very bright and they have to adjust to it. So basically, if a person could escape uh, and turn around, they would see a fire and they'd see these people whom they hadn't seen before who were holding up these objects. In other words, the people who are controlling the culture are controlling what they see and what they hear. And they're going to realize that, that therefore what they have been perceiving on the cave wall is not really the whole of reality. It's only a little thin slice. And yes, who is manipulating you? Exactly, Ramses. They will then see that they are being manipulated by these objects and by the sounds. Uh, but this is clearly not reality. It's only a form of imprisonment and manipulation. <laughs> And in a certain sense, what Plato is saying is, began, this is an allegory, he's not saying we're all chained up, but he is saying we're all being manipulated, for sure. And we're being manipulated by major media, we're being manipulated by uh, political influences, we're being manipulated by the uh, business influences, the commercial influences uh, that control politics by and large today, influences from Silicon Valley or influences from uh, big pharma or influences from whoever wants to sell you things, uh, we're all being manipulated. And the task of philosophy is to be able to pierce those veils of manipulation and perceive reality for what it is. That's not easy to do. And it's particularly not easy to do when you have to peel away more and more layers of technology as we do today. Nonetheless, uh, Plato is saying in the first instance that uh, if you were able to free yourself, stand up and look behind you, you would certainly realize you're being manipulated. But the allegory goes much deeper than that, because eventually you would see, says Plato, a way out of the cave. If you looked around, you could definitely slip past these people, as some are, and eventually you would see some stairs leading out of the cave. And if you then stepped out of the cave, says Plato, and into the sunlight, uh, that, for Plato, represents reality. The cave represents the world of appearance, and outside the cave represents the world of reality. But, of course, as soon as you step into that world, you'll be even more blinded, yeah? Because the sun is a lot brighter than the fire. So, once again, you would be totally blinded initially, but then your eyes would adjust eventually, and you would begin to see what we would call the real world outside the cave. Now, for Plato, that's also part of the allegory. So understand that the world outside the cave, for Plato, represents the world of forms, uh, and what's inside the cave represents the world of appearances or copies of forms. So I cannot really explain any more now without saying what these forms are and, 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 and describing or explaining their importance in Plato's philosophy. So what Plato wants to tell us and I'll give you an example in a moment that should make this crystal clear for you. What Plato wants to tell us is that everything in the world uh, that we perceive uh, is a copy of a form. That the material world, uh, in its totality, is a world of copies. Whether nature makes these copies or whether we make these copies, they're all copies of forms, better or worse. So an obvious example would be, let's say, a spherical object. 
Let's consider for a moment, because it's easy to do this, spherical objects or somewhat spherical objects. Now, nature is full of them. Can anyone give examples of sort of roughly spherical objects that we would encounter in nature, either on a large scale or a, or a smaller scale? Does anyone just enter in the chat room? Fruits, yes, very good. Jesse, oranges, grapes, definitely. They're not perfectly spherical, but they're definitely spherical, yes. So are apples, and, and, and so are many other kinds of fruits. Yes, melons too, tomatoes, right? More or less spherical, yeah. Pearls, yeah, they're very much spherical, even harsh, better in a certain sense, spheres, that is the closer. Maybe a rock or a boulder, yeah, there are some spherical rocks, definitely. What about on a large scale? Our eyes, yeah, our eyes are spherical. I hope yours are. Certainly are. <laughs> they certainly are, for the most part. Planets, exactly. Now you're thinking planets and suns, yes. So so Plato is, is, is looking at the world and he's saying, isn't it interesting that we encounter in nature so many objects that have this form, you see? And Plato believed, and he's not giving any evidence for this, he's only asserting his own philosophy or possibly what he picked up from Socrates, but it seems to be really Plato's view at this point in his career, that all of these different spherical objects are copies of something whether nature made them or indeed whether we did because excuse me we also have spherical objects of human origin do we not could someone give some examples of spherical objects anyone a ball yeah Ramses I mean there are many right soccer balls are spherical basketballs tennis balls ping pong balls yes baseballs so many kinds of balls that we play with are spherical right beach balls yeah they're spherical so they're also copies. And Plato would say, and the Greeks had, had balls too. They had, you know, sock. I'm sure they had, they had some kind of primitive spheres that they played with. Uh, so uh, as well as, as, as slingshots, which were a weapon. And they were probably hurling somewhat spherical objects out of them too, looking for the right shape and size of stone and so forth. So Plato looks at all this and he says, wait a second. All these things are approximations of what? When we call them spherical, we really mean they're copies of the pure form of the sphere. That's where the pure form comes in. And in the case of spheres, we can actually picture it. All of you, I am sure, can picture a perfect sphere. Yes? And in fact, we can even do better than that. We can write the equation of it. We can write x squared plus, I'm typing this in, right? I think I'm typing it in. Uh, x squared plus, um, where's my, there it is, plus y squared plus z squared. Some of you know this if you're studying math. Presumably you know that this is the equation equals r squared, right? This is the equation of a perfect sphere, is it not? x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. That describes a perfect sphere. Yeah, that's the perfect sphere. Now, here's my question, and this is Plato's question. Can we actually manufacture a perfect sphere? Does nature make a perfect sphere itself? Is, are any of these objects in nature that we see as spherical, are they perfect spheres? No, they aren't, Arsh. And can we make a perfect sphere? Can we manufacture one? No, we can't. Even if you go to a factory that makes really high-quality ball bearings, which we use in machinery, you know, bearings are absolutely key components of engines. <laughs> And um, if we use uh, those bearings uh, in, in, in high-precision engines, we need them to be engineered to a very high degree of tolerance. But what would happen if you took a marble, a glass marble, which appears perfectly spherical, or you took a steel ball bearing that had been manufactured to a high, high tolerance, uh, and it appears and feels perfectly spherical? What if you start magnifying it? What are you going to see at some point? when you start holding up those spheres that we manufacture to higher and higher uh, degrees of magnification, what will you detect? Anyone? That's right, Jesse. Flaws, Ilma. Flaws, blemishes, bumps, depressions, scratches. So even they won't be perfect. And this is Plato's point, that we can never make a perfect sphere. 
Nature doesn't make them. Obviously, fruits can't be perfect because they're attached to trees. They need to have a stem, you know, so there's always going to be a little a little flaw in the in the in the sphericity. And anything that we make, if it's a ball that we inflate, it's going to have, you know, a nozzle and so forth. Okay, so there's always going to be a difference, Arsh, on any scale, whether it's a cosmic scale or a mundane scale or a microscopic scale. There's no perfect sphere that's made of material. But Plato says, yes, but they're all copies of the ideal sphere, right? The ideal sphere, the perfect sphere. So the perfect sphere for Plato is an, is an idea, right? It's a conception. The perfect sphere is an idea. Can you all imagine a perfect sphere? I'm sure you can all imagine a perfect sphere. Of course our planet isn't perfect, Ramses. It's an oblate spheroid because of, of, of gravitational forces and rotational forces. It's flattened at the poles. So all I'm saying is what Plato says, that we can picture a perfect sphere. All of you can picture it in your imaginations. Yeah? Um, but we cannot manufacture one. Okay? Is this clear? We cannot, we cannot manufacture one. Oh, you can't see what I wrote because I wasn't writing it to everybody. I apologize. Just let me reply to all. Um, it's, it's nothing earth-shaking. I've already said it a few times. The perfect sphere is an idea. It doesn't exist in the world, neither in nature nor in the, in the world of, of, of technology. But we can always imagine it. So there are better and worse copies. Is this clear? We're now going to show how this connects to the ethics and, and to justice. So, so everything, Plato says, is like this. Um, if, uh, if we make chairs... If you ask Plato, why are some chairs more comfortable than others? Plato will say because there's a perfect form of a chair. And if you're really good at making chairs, then you're going to make a copy of a chair that's closer to the perfect form. And that copy, therefore, will, will be actually more comfortable to sit in. Whereas if you're sitting in a really uncomfortable chair, Plato would say the guy who made that chair had no idea of what the perfect form of a chair would be or was very far removed from the perfect form of a chair. So the chair uh, that this person made is, is not very comfortable, and that's because they did not have a very clear notion of the pure form of a chair. So do you begin to see how this applies? Yeah? So... Well, no, Ramses, it's not the case that there is no such thing as a perfect thing, because if you allow a thing to be an idea, then the idea can certainly be perfect, okay? It's our copy that can never be perfect, okay? We could come close, but we can never make perfect copies of the pure form, because this world, by definition, is imperfect for Plato. Physically, that's right. Physically, the world is always going to be imperfect, but ideationally, we as human beings are particularly gifted because our minds have the powers, as Plato said, to apprehend the pure forms. So it's not that we have the pure forms in our minds even. It's that our minds can reach this realm beyond space and time. Our minds can connect us to this realm in which the pure forms are eternally subsisting and our minds therefore are able to apprehend the pure form and the craftsman who can apprehend the pure form of the thing that he or she wants to build will therefore build a better a better copy of it it's the same thing with instruments uh, you know if you ask why is why is why is do some flutes sound better than other flutes why do some cellos sound better than other cellos well it would be because the maker in this case also had a clearer idea of the pure form of that instrument. So everything we make has a pure form. Almost everything we make has a pure form. And our challenge, therefore, whether we're going to be craftspeople or whether we're going to be legislators, would be to make the best copies we can imagine. And, uh, well, Ron asks, how do you prove it? Well, we can... Plato doesn't offer this as a proof. Uh, he, is, he is offering speculative philosophy. He admits that he can't prove any of this. He's just offering us his system of understanding how it is that the world is imperfect and why it is we keep striving toward this unattainable perfection. Uh, but he's also got a very strong moral and political message in it, okay? Because 
it would apply in the same way to legislators. In other words, if the laws are bad, says Plato, it's because the legislators do not have a good idea of the pure form of justice. Because justice also has a pure form, but that's more abstract. Nonetheless, says Plato, if the lawmakers have a good grasp of the pure form of justice, then the copies they make, the laws they make, will, of course, be more just. <coughs> if the lawmakers do not have a good grasp of the pure form of justice, if they have only a tenuous or a poor grasp of it, then they will end up crafting laws which will be very bad copies and which therefore may well be unjust. Is this clear? So it directly connects to his theory of politics and his theory of justice. It's all based on pure forms. Is that okay so far? There's more, but I just want to make sure we're okay. So society can never be perfect. That's right, Arsh. Plato is really saying in a certain sense that society could never be perfect because our copies can never be perfect, but they can be better rather than worse. And Plato's Republic <laughs> is a whole uh, design of what an ideal society would look like. The closest we could come, says Plato, would be to do what is advised in the Republic. <coughs> Excuse me. So now let me describe a little more carefully how that works. And then we'll look at some of Plato's words, too. I'm not just going to give you my gloss. I want you to see what Plato has to say, especially about the pure form of the good, because for Plato, that's the highest form, the most important form. So as far as society goes, Plato has a very interesting view. And he thinks that justice, in a practical sense, of course, if you're a lawmaker, you need to have some... some you, apprehension of the pure form of justice in order to make just laws. But also, he says, there's something else about justice. And justice is going to be, uh, on the individual level, a question of a balanced soul. So if you have a, a, a grasp of the pure form of justice, that will bring your soul into balance. And Plato's version of the soul, remember, Plato's a pagan, right? This is, <laughs> this is three or four centuries before you know, B.C. So Plato's Plato's view of the soul and, and Aristotle's view is very similar. Plato's view is that the soul has three parts. There's the appetitive or instinctive part, which we kind of relate to the gut. Uh, and then there's the emotional part, uh, and that's related to the heart. And then there's the uh, rational part, which is related to the mind. Yeah, so each of those three components of the soul is active in us. And uh, in order for us to actually be just citizens, Plato says we need to bring the soul into balance. And if people are acting unjustly, it's because one or more components are out of balance. For Plato. Um, how do you square Socrates' dedication to right laws? Because, again, if you read the Crito, Socrates is very clear about this, Ron. Socrates says that the laws are just, and therefore I have to follow them. I followed them all my life in Athens, and I never complained about them. If I had not liked the laws, I should have left, at, or I should have sought to change them, or, or I, I could have left. I was free to leave Athens my whole life, and I never did, because I believed that Athens had just laws. And now that they've used the laws against me, the laws are still just. It's just the men who are using them who are, who are corrupt. And if I flee Athens, I will be returning injustice for injustice, and that could never work. The world will never be a more just place if we respond to injustice with more injustice. So two wrongs don't make a right, in other words. So he, he set an example, um, and he died virtuously. If you want to be a cynic, you could also say he was 70 years old, and, uh, you know, yeah, so, so he, you know, he, maybe he had already lived a long life. Maybe a younger man wouldn't have done this, but uh, we don't know. We can't second guess, okay? I know. I know. I'm getting there, too. But we can't second guess. So, uh, anyway, back to Plato. And uh, Plato's idea is that if you're a just citizen, then your soul is in balance, 
Um, and but if you if your appetites are out of balance, right, then you might become avaricious. You might become criminal. You might seek to exploit others. That's because your appetites are out of balance, right? If you get carried away too easily and you commit crimes of passion, it's because your heart is not balanced. That part of your soul, you know, so you're very easily upset by things, and you you know you find it hard to stay on a steady keel because you're too emotional at times. That would be an imbalance of the heart part of the soul. And if you reason wrongly, you know. If you come to the wrong conclusions or you don't use the power of your mind to apprehend the forms and you make very bad copies of things, that's because your reason is out of balance. So for Plato, in order to be a just person, we really need to balance our souls. And this gets mirrored in the Republic. It's a really very interesting story, he tells, because he's also saying that in his ideal city-state, he says that all of the different classes are mirrors of the soul. In other words, what you have in a city-state are a huge number of people who are dedicated to the production of necessities. So you have farmers and you have craftspeople, and they are producing the things that we need to consume. Every society needs to have a food supply, and every society needs to have implements, tools, you know, furniture, clothing, all these things that are manufactured for our nece our necessity and our comfort. So those are the things that are made by the farmers and the craftspeople. And they have to be in balance with the people who look after the defense and protection of the state. And though and that and that's the army. Those are the, you know, the people who keep peace and who protect us and they have to have great heart they have to have courage for example they have to be able to be willing to risk their lives in order to protect their fellow citizens so they are people who are focused mostly in in this emotional part of the soul and then you have the rulers and the rulers says plato absolutely need to be highly rational they need to be people whose strength is the rational mind in order to be able to govern justly. But for the state to be balanced, you also need, in a certain sense, each of those components of the soul to be reflected in the different pastimes, the different occupations that people have in the state, and that people should do the things they're fitted to do, and the state should not interfere very much with its own constitution. Interestingly, Plato was not a fan of big government. He thought that if people could discover their own talents, they would find their way and they would make contributions. And if their souls were balanced, we'd have a just society. Plato also has a really interesting theory about the leaders, and this has never been tried. We've, we've tried every crazy political system under the sun. Uh, and um, I remember Churchill's aphorism, you know, one of my favorite aphorisms about democracy. Uh, Arsh is asking what were his views on democracy. He, <laughs> you won't like him. Uh, you may not like them, Arsh. I'll tell you what Plato thought. But, uh, you know, Churchill's aphorism about democracy is that he said it's the worst form of government except for all the other ones. <laughs> so, you know, essentially, there's no, perfect, there's no perfect political system either. They're all going to be copies of the pure form. But here's what Plato thought. I'm glad you're laughing, Jesse. Keep your sense of humor. You're going to need it. But here's what Plato thought, and this has never been tried at all. Plato said that the rulers who belong to a class he called the guardians in Plato's Republic, in Plato's Utopia, the ruling class, they're not called elites. They're called guardians. Their job is to guard, is to safeguard the ideals of the state. The army protects the state physically, and the producers, you know, produce all the food and all the stuff we need. But the guardians are the political people, and they're responsible for safeguarding the whole. And in Plato's system, the guardians are not permitted to own property. They are not permitted to use their political power to enrich themselves. And there has never, I submit to you, rarely if ever has there been a society in which the rulers have failed to enrich themselves one way or another. We see it conspicuously. It's on, it's on extravagant display right now. Uh, ruling classes enrich themselves by using their positions of power for private gain and to hell with everybody else because they're going to make enough money to be safe when they're booted out of office. So they don't, some of them really care, right? And, uh, well, I'm just saying, uh, we see this over and over again. Uh, uh, it's hard to meet a ruler, you know, a political leader, be, be it a dictator, be it a theocrat, be it someone who's democratically elected. It's hard to meet someone who does not enrich themselves and their families. Plato's view was 
and this is very radical, right? I mean, radical in a, in a way that's never been tried. Plato's view was that the guardians would be selected at, at, at a young age for their <clears throat> promise, for their, their ability to govern, and they would never be permitted to enrich themselves. They would be given this power of, of, govern, of governance, but they would own no property their needs would be would be supplied. Of course, they'd have a place to live and they'd be given meals, but they would have no property and they would, and not only that, but they wouldn't even be able to raise their own children. Their children would be, would be taken from them so they would not be tempted to enrich themselves for the sake of, of giving money to their children either. So the guardians would be devoted only to protecting the state at a political level and would not be permitted to be corrupted by any personal gain or any gain for their families. Needless to say, that's never been tried. And you might also be amazed to know, I mean, Plato's Republic was written again in the 4th century BC. Plato also supposed that women could be guardians too. This may shock you because we're talking about a world which was very different from our own. Women didn't get the vote in this country only, you know, until 100 years ago. Same in the UK, only 100 years ago. Plato was, was, was supposing almost 2,500 years ago, 2,400 years ago, that women would, would also be able to be guardians. Of course, ones who had, the, who had the aptitude to do so. So he didn't discriminate. So we find that, we find that Plato, well, the problem, Ramses, is as you say that who will educate the educators who will be who will govern the guardians nobody will govern the guardians ramses but the guardians will be educated and who do you think is going to educate the guardians it's going to be philosophers so this is plato's role of the so-called philosopher king the philosopher is not the king but the philosopher is the one who trains them so that they will be less tempted and less corruptible and it is the philosopher who also is the one who gets freed from the cave. And Plato asks this question, what would happen, he says, if you went out of the cave and suddenly understood reality as it was in terms of the forms? Yes, you saw the pure forms and you realized that everything was just better or worse copies. Would you not want to go back to the cave and free up the other people and let them know about this amazing world outside the cave? Of course you would. And then Plato asks a question, what do you think would happen to the person who went back into the cave and started telling these prisoners about the world outside? What do you think their response would be? Anybody? What, what, what might their response be to the one who comes back into the cave? Uh, Arsh says that they're lying. Yeah, they, they might they might think they're lying. They wouldn't want to listen, Ilma. Yeah, they probably would. Heresy, Jesse, yes. They might accuse the person of being crazy because they had seen something that the others had not seen, right? They were trying to shake them out of their uh, world, which is a very difficult thing to do. And Plato goes on to say, quite pointedly, that they might even kill him to shut him up, which is exactly, he says, what they did to Socrates because it was Socrates who wanted to lead society out of the cave also, but they weren't ready to listen to him in sufficient numbers. So that's part of the allegory of the cave, all right? It's very thought-provoking, is it not? And it might also explain why, I'm not saying it's the explanation, but it might also help explain to us why so many people in uh, human history who are liberators, who are emancipators, who, who, who are giving us breakthroughs in various ways, are accused of being heretics, or accused of being liars, or accused of being subverters, and are very often assassinated or imprisoned or put to death, uh, because people somehow are comfortable in the way they are chained up to that cave wall, and often don't want to be shaken out of it, especially if they have a remote, so they can keep changing the channel you know, and maybe room service so they get, you know, stuff brought to them. Okay, so um, it does make a lot of sense, and, and, and this is part of the reason why we're still studying what Plato... Now you can see why Christianity adopted this. Oh, Jesse, I haven't even touched on that yet. 
Uh, but I'm going, if you're starting to see connections with Christianity, good for you. You're actually ahead of the curve. Now I'm going to spell it out quite explicitly, okay? So this is really interesting. And Plato had no way of knowing. You know, I mean, Plato was writing this almost four centuries before the birth of Jesus. He had no way of knowing about Christianity. But it turns out that he gave us a metaphysics, which is so perfect that it fit extremely well later with with the Christian metaphysic. And I'll explain Plato's version of this. And then some of you are going to tell me what the Christianity equivalent is uh, when that light comes on and you'll see the connection. Okay, so here's what Plato said. We have to uh, explain the connection between the pure forms and the copies. We're missing a piece in the puzzle because if the pure forms exist outside the world of things, the pure forms, as Plato said, exist outside of space and time. Okay? Outside of space and time. So they're not material. They are immaterial. And yet they coexist in some way with the copies, right? Because, you know, we're making copies of them which are in the material world, in the natural world. So what's the connection? Again, we have this problem with dualism. How do they connect? How do the material things connect with the immaterial things? And Plato's explanation is that there is a third thing that connects them. And that thing is called essence. And I'm typing this in because it's very important. Essence. Essence connects, for Plato, essence connects, I'm typing this in, connects the pure forms, which are immaterial. Remember, pure forms have no material existence. So essence is the thing that connects the pure forms to the copies, and the copies are all material. So essence like commutes between the, I said forms, I meant forms, right? Forms. Okay, so essence connects the pure forms to the copies. So Plato would say the following thing. Let's say that you find a sculpture or a painting or some work of art to be very beautiful or a song or whatever, some work of art or a book, and you say, well, this is a very beautiful work of art. Plato would say to you, the reason that you find it beautiful is that the artist was able to imbue it with the essence of beauty. So there's a pure form of beauty, which is immaterial, and then there are copies of beauty, which we call beautiful things. And the reason we're able to recognize them, says Plato, as beautiful is because they contain the essence of beauty. They are filled with the essence of beauty. And the essence is the thing that connects the form to the copy. <laughs> and that is why Plato's philosophy is often called essentialism. Because remember, this is really important, that for Plato, yes, the essence precedes the existence. In other words, nothing could possibly exist materially unless it had the essence of some form flowing into it. So essence comes first in the order of things. Before existence, nobody could make a copy of anything if not for the essence of the thing flowing into it from the pure form. And that is why it took 2,000 years for people to rebut Plato's philosophy with existentialism, right? In the 20th century, along come the existentialists and say, no, 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 Plato had it backwards. Actually, existence precedes essence. But it took 2,000 years to come up with that. Plato's philosophy held sway for more than 2,000 years. And this view of essentialism is the view that is highly compatible with Christianity. Because now let me ask you a direct question. If we're talking about a pure form, on the one hand, we're talking about a pure form and then we're saying that that pure form itself can be connected. So I'm typing this in pure form with an arrow. OK, and then there's the essence, which is neither material nor immaterial. It's hard to explain what the essence is, but it definitely connects to the copy. OK, and if the copy has enough essence in it, we'd say it's a really good copy. So does this remind you of anything in, in Christianity? Yes, I'm trying to respond to everyone, but if, if people would stop messaging me privately, then I would be able to answer everybody without constantly resetting my, 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 my chat tool, okay? So please say what you have to say to the group. Let's, sh let's share the wealth. Don't say it to me privately. Say it to everybody, okay? Now you're seeing it, right, Jesse? There's a pure form. There's an essence. You're welcome. There's a pure form, an essence, and a copy. 
Now, if that's the ontology, and this is Plato's ontology, the pure forms are immaterial, the copy is a material thing, and the essence is this mystical kind of connection between the immaterial and the material. Does this remind you of anything in Christianity? I mean, this is so fundamental, I shouldn't even have to say it. Does it? Does it? The essence? No, the essence is not God. You're on the right track. What's God in this schema? We're talking only about the Christian faith, because it doesn't apply to Judaism and it doesn't apply to Islam. But that it's why it's why Plato was so important in the history of Christianity. The essence is not God. Yes, God is the pure form. That's right. God is the pure form. And if God is the pure form, what's the copy of God in Christianity? No, we are not. No, no, not Satan. You guys, come on, you're way off track this morning. You haven't had your coffee. That's right. Jesus, the Son of God, is the copy. The Son of God is embodied, right? Supposedly, right? Is is the is 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 the body, right? And what is the essence then? This should be easy. If you have the Father and the Son, what's missing? What's the essence? The Holy Spirit, exactly. And that's presumably how Mary was impregnated, right? Because she's a virgin, remember? So the Trinity which came much later after Plato, actually is captured by Plato's scheme of the pure form, the essence, and the copy. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the, are the pure form, the copy, and, and the essence that connects them. And so Plato provided this very interesting metaphysical scheme on which the Christian trinity fits like a glove. Because Judaism and Islam don't buy into the Trinity, right? There are God, there's God and there's prophet, right? In, in Judaism, you have God, which is one thing, and, and Moses is the prophet. In Islam, you have God, which is one. Allah is one thing, and Muhammad is the last prophet for Muslims. So you don't have this Trinity, right? We have, we have prophets, not sons of God. And that's one of the differences in, in, within the Abrahamic faiths. They all subscribe to God, but the Trinity is particular to the Christian aspect of the Abrahamic faiths. And Plato inadvertently provided this really interesting metaphysical schema for the Trinity. So you can make that connection if you wish. And that accounts for the, partly accounts for the importance of Plato and Christian cultures. Now, let me tell you something else. Since one of you mentioned Satan, uh, we have to touch on this too. Nobody has asked yet um, whether there's, um, no, it's not the statues, Arsh. No, 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 idolatry, you're worshiping bad copies, they would say, right? <laughs> an, an idol is a bad copy of God, okay? So that would be idolatry, yeah? Uh, but now let's get back to the ethics. I have two points to make in seven minutes, so we're going to, uh, Plato cannot be covered very easily in one lecture, but here, the, 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 at least, you know, the ethics, we're trying to get across the main points. Nobody asked about the pure form of evil. I mean, if there's a pure form of good, isn't there a pure form of evil? No, the answer for Plato is no. Plato cannot allow evil to have equal standing with good. And so for Plato, what we call evil is basically ignorance of what is good. And Plato got this from Socrates pretty much. According to Socrates, and I think Plato too, anybody who glimpsed the pure form of goodness or the pure form of justice would be incapable of acting evilly or unjustly. So when people do act toward one another with injustice, Plato would say they do so not because they're bad, they do so because they're ignorant. And Plato was actually more egalitarian than you might suppose because he believed that we are all born with innate virtue. In other words, all of us have the virtues that Aristotle said we need to practice, right, in order to exercise, in order to be brave. We have to practice doing brave things. You remember Aristotle's version of virtue ethics? In order to be just, we have to do just acts, right? For Aristotle, it's all about practicing these virtues. For Plato, it's about apprehending the pure forms with the mind. And that's why they differed so significantly. Aristotle's arm outward in the painting and Plato's pointing up to the sky. For Plato, we have to contemplate goodness in order to be good. We have to contemplate justice in order to be just. So it's more an act of contemplation. 
And Plato goes on to say, and I'll just share the quote with you. It's it's from the uh, uh, a book. You know, it's in your book. And uh, uh, Red Self bounced me out of there. So just bear with me for a second uh, while I pull this up. And I'll share the quotation with you. And again, Plato doesn't give an argument for this. Uh, Plato is just stating this as his philosophy without any other uh, need of proof or support. He's just more or less stating this to you. But I want to share the screen so you can see it in his own words. Uh, if I'm able to pull it up this morning, looks like it's going to give me a little trouble. Zoom's going to give me a little trouble pulling up the quote, but I'll try to see if it's there. Okay, you should be able to see it now. This is from your textbook. And Plato goes on in that highlighted paragraph to say that whether it's true or not, he says only the gods know. Remember, the Greeks believed in many gods, okay? But he says, this is how I see it. This is in Plato's words. In the knowable realm, in other words, the realm that can be apprehended by the power of the human mind, the form of the good is the last thing to be seen. And it is reached only with difficulty. Once one has seen it, however, one must conclude that it is the cause of all that is correct and beautiful in anything, and that it produces both light as its source in the visible realm, and that in the intelligible realm it controls and provides truth and understanding, so that anyone who is to act sensibly in private or in public must see it. So our challenge for Plato is to get out of the cave and to apprehend the pure form of goodness. And once we do that, we will act justly, we will have understanding. And he does not accord evil in equal place in his scheme. There's no pure form of evil. Good is like the sun that illuminates all the other forms, but it's also, ironically for Plato, the most difficult form of all to apprehend, but it's the most important one. And this also gives you another parallel between Plato and the Abrahamic faiths. Because if there is no pure form of evil, and the evil is only ignorance of good, then there cannot be anything, for example, in Christianity, that is as powerful as God, who is good, right? Ostensibly, God is good. So who in Christianity plays the role of evil? What's the ultimate evil being? The ultimate evil being is the devil, right? But remember, Jesse, that the devil's a fallen angel, right? So the devil is not as powerful as God. The devil is always going to be relegated to a secondary role. Okay? So this is another parallel that that God is supposed to be a force for the for good and 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 has no rival, has no equal and opposite. And in Plato's ethics, the pure form of goodness is like the sun that illuminates all other pure forms. And also, it has no equal and opposite. When people do evil, it's only because they're ignorant of the good. Okay? So that's, in, in a nutshell, Plato's theory of justice. But one more point. This may shock some of you, but I'm going to shock you again. Okay? Uh, Plato has another story in the Republic called The Myth of Gyges' Ring. I'll type that in. Hopefully, everybody can see this. It's a story of a ring, Gyges' ring. And this ring, and you stop me when you, when you know what this ring is uh, in more contemporary terms, you can type it in. Uh, but here's the story from Plato. A shepherd boy finds a ring. You know, it's a normal shepherd out with his sheep, and he finds a ring. And he discovers that the ring is a magical ring, and if he puts the ring on, he becomes invisible. So what does the shepherd do with the ring? He says, ah, I'm going to use this ring now to become powerful. So he goes back to the city with this ring. He makes himself invisible. He's able to get into the palace. He seduces the queen. They kill the king. That's right. That's right, Arsh. He, he, he seduces the queen and kills the king, and he becomes king, and he's got this ring of power. But then, of course, he has a miserable life because he's constantly watching over his shoulder, and people find out about the ring. They want to take it from him, and they're willing to kill him. Have we, have we seen a movie recently that... Uh, <laughs> that is based on that theme. It's not too big a stretch, right? Is anybody reminded of anything? 
a huge movie? Lord of the Rings. Thank you, Jesse. Huge, fabulous movie based on Tolkien. Well, I got news for you. J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote the book, was also a Plato scholar, and he knew perfectly well about the Ring of Gyges. And basically, the Ring is the story of the human, uh, let's say, capacity for being corrupted by power. And so in Plato's Republic, and here's the bottom line for Plato, if we lived in a truly just society, says Plato, where people individually were balanced in their souls and where overall the, you know, the, the rulers were uh, making sure that the polity was balanced too with just laws, then nobody would want or need the ring. In Plato's Republic, if somebody came to town with a wheelbarrow full of those rings and was giving them away, nobody would want them because people would say that ring is only going to bring me misery and trouble and sorrow. There's nothing that I want that that ring can give me. I already have everything I want. And so imagine that. And now I put it to you. If somebody came to New York City with a wheelbarrow full of those rings, you think people would want them? Yes, I think so, Jesse. You put that in capital, so I guess they'd be gone in a hurry, right? Well, then what would Plato say? Plato would say, well, this is obviously not a very well-governed and not a very just place, because if everybody thinks they're going to be better off by getting a hold of Gaiji's ring, then there must be a pretty miserable state of affairs. Yes, there would be ignorance everywhere. Ignorance of what, Arsh? Ignorance of the pure forms. Because if you balance your soul and you apprehend the pure form then you realize that God Jesus ring will bring you nothing but trouble and you won't want it. So that's how far we are in the world today. And I would venture, I would venture to speculate that most, most countries, most cities are places where if you showed up with a wheelbarrow full of God Jesus rings, then people would probably take them, want them, imagine that they would be beneficial to them. So Plato's message is that's only because there's still too much ignorance in the world, okay? But those who are balanced, no, you won't suffer if you're balanced. That's a different story, Arsh. Okay, Socrates didn't suffer uh, at all. If you his his disciples were all weeping at his death, but not Socrates. He was he was quite happy to go to his death with honor. Okay, um, so I think that's a lot of food for thought this morning. Uh, Plato gives us a lot to think about, but I wanted to convey to you the main point about his allegory of the cave. And, and this distinction with Aristotle, so Plato's notion of goodness is it's a pure form. It's not a byproduct of virtue. It's a pure form that the mind needs to apprehend. And uh, can I describe how this relates to atheists? Well, uh, not really, Ron, <laughs> because, I mean, atheists are, are not much with this program, okay? Uh, they're going to be more materialistic and look for a utopia in a different solution, right? A different solution. So uh, that's another class. We'll, we'll talk about that in a future class for sure. It will come up. But when we, when we deal with Plato, we're, we're, we're looking at something that really fits well with, you know, although it's a pagan philosophy, is you could see how well it happens to suit the religious scheme that followed it. It's really a nice fit. And that's why we see Plato in the middle of this Italian Renaissance hanging in the Vatican, this pagan guy hanging in the Vatican. Why? because he anticipated so much of value to Christian cultures, it's obvious that, that, that he's a great philosopher to be taken up by them. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? So atheists don't, don't have a pure form, Arsh. I mean, now you guys are on this. Okay, no, atheists don't really have a pure form. So they're living, Plato would say they're, they're living a more impoverished life because they have to reject all that mystical stuff. You know, they, they really have to just like, what you see is what you get. And so they're living in a materialistic world for the most part. And therefore, in a sense, they're living only in the world of copies and they're missing out on the, on the elegance uh, and the enchantment of the pure forms. So they really don't know what they're missing. <laughs> That's another way of looking at it. Okay, is that clear? Is that good enough? We're going to elaborate uh, on this in, in Thursday's class. You're more than welcome. Uh, I'm glad you found it interesting, Paul. Plato is interesting. This is why you all know. His... Now I hope you have a better idea of why you know Plato's name. Okay, why are we still studying this guy after all these centuries? Well, he has some things to say that, that have some traction with us today and are definitely worth thinking about. Okay, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. 
uh, or should the ideology part was confusing? Well, you should be confused about something. It's a philosophy class. If you don't walk out of here confused about something, or I'm not doing my job, okay? So we'll, we'll hopefully clarify this on Thursday. Now, uh, one of you at least wanted to see me, um, and I can see you briefly at 11 o'clock, okay? If it was Ilma, if you're still there. Uh, but you have to come to the Blackboard course room, okay? The Blackboard course room. Which statues, uh, Arsh, are you asking about? What do statues represent? Well, well, statues in idolatry, that's a different topic. For Plato, the Greeks were all idolaters. So for them, they didn't distinguish idolatry. They made statues because they were trying to make copies of beautiful things. The Greek idea was to copy beauty. It wasn't idolatry. They weren't worshiping the statues. They were, they were trying to make beautiful copies of the human form. And, and that's called mimetic realism. For them, sculpture is copy. All art is copy. And the, the quality of the sculpture, again, would be gauged by how realistic it is. How beautifully does it capture the ideal human form? And if it did that well, then Plato would say it's infused with the essence of beauty. And it's a beautiful sculpture. And this is, uh, yes, they had a mathematical formula. That's right, Jesse, back to geometry. Remember, Aristotle's love of geometry came from Plato's academy. They thought geometry was very important. As a matter of fact, Plato said quite explicitly that people should study geometry for 10 years before they study ethics and politics. Because ethics and politics are much more difficult and much more contentious. And we're all going to agree more readily on the properties of geometric objects because that's objective. <laughs> And we're only going to get mired when we allow subjectivity to creep into ethics and politics. But for Plato, it's just as objective because the pure form of a sphere is not conceptually different. It may be expressed differently, but it's not conceptually different from the pure form of justice. A pure form is a pure form. It's just easier for us to, to get the geometric ones. The ethical ones and the political ones have, have much more controversy attached to them. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. But I'm very glad to see all of this uh, uh, interest. Yeah, Pythagoras predates them. That's right, Arsh. And the Greeks had a great love of geometry, but that's been in their, it was in their culture for many generations. And also a connection with music. Yeah, also that. So uh, we can talk more about that on Thursday. So have a very good week, everyone. All right. And I uh, wish you well. I hope that you've uh, enjoyed Plato and that you'll read for yourselves at least the extract from the Republic and more. You can find it online. It's very easy to find. You'll encounter Gaiji's ring and, uh, you know, you'll encounter a lot of other themes we've touched on today. So consider Plato's ethics and also consider him in contrast with Aristotle. And next week we're going to meet a philosopher who rejects both of them, needless to say. We're going to meet Thomas Hobbes, who thinks he has a much better picture of the human being, a much more modern picture, 1651. Uh, but he's going to reject both Plato and Aristotle and give us his view of ethics and justice, which I assure you will be just as different in a, in a very radically different direction and will also provoke a lot of thought. OK, have a wonderful week, everybody. I'll see some of you Thursday and I'll see hopefully uh, the majority of you next Monday. Say good care. I'll stop Thank the you, recording now. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. I'll stop the recording now.